Hi, everybody. How much fun was that? Right? Yeah. I mean, let's give a huge hand to the Indian Arts Initiative for organizing that. Um, I would have come just for the episodes alone, even though I've already seen the show. Um, I'd love to first just uh, do a brief introduction of our esteemed panelists. So first we have our resident academic, Dr. Peter Fang, um, who has multiple degrees, including a PhD in film studies from the University of Iowa. He's the author of Identities in Motion. I printed this out in big print, but apparently not big enough. Um, so Identities in Motion, Asian American Film and Video, and the editor of two collections, Screening Asian Americans and Chinese Connections. He's published articles in numerous scholarly journals, and he teaches courses in theory, Asian American lit, and film studies at the University of Delaware. And he's currently working on a book about the television industry. Okay, um, we also have Samir Rao, who's a graduate of Haverford College and Bryn Mawr Graduate School of Social Work and Social Research. He is currently a reporter and blogger for Color Lines, look him up, which focuses on cultural news. As a freelance writer, in addition to his blogging, his work has appeared in Stereo Gum, Vice's Noisy, Under the Radar, Split Cider, Philadelphia City Paper, WXPN's The Key, Philly Voice, and The Public School Notebook. Very prolific, very impressive. Um, and it's interesting, he's also appeared in The Independent Restaurant Tour. So even though his writing primarily focuses on popular culture and the arts and critical theory and race and gender, he clearly has good taste. So he's also worked as a nonprofit marketing coordinator, caseworker, and community organizer. Okay, next we have Sara Zia. Ibrahimi. Ibrahimi is an MFA graduate of Temple University and a curator of film, visual art, and new media. For over a decade, she's produced film screenings and exhibits in the Philadelphia area. Um, and that's awarded her several grants, so she's actually been able to screen her work internationally. Very, very impressive. She's also worked as a consultant with independent television services as well as independent filmmakers. She currently works as a social media specialist at American Friends Service Committee, and in the spring of 2015, she released her first web series, Bailout, which she wrote and directed. Pretty cool panel so far, right? And finally, we have Arjun Shankar, um, recently completed a PhD in anthropology and education, and he's currently on a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice um, in Curiosity, a Transdisciplinary Approach. He describes himself, are you ready for this, as a teacher, writer, researcher, and media maker, both unabashedly curious and intellectually promiscuous. <laughs> His words, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> His research brings together theories in globalization and urban development, literary and digital ethnography, and critical pedagogy. He's collaborated on several participatory film and photography projects, and he teaches courses on participatory film, social change, and globalization at Penn. So, our esteemed panelists. So I've got a couple questions here prepared, um, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. So I, I thought that we could first start by just asking these panelists, what they're watching these days, what they look for in a TV show or a movie. I don't know about you, but I only read certain movie critics and film critics because I know that they're going to talk about the issues that I'm interested in. So I thought that it would really be interesting to hear what they're watching and why. All right, go ahead, take it away. I mean, I, I think I'm like everybody else watching less and less network television, more and more streaming uh, television on Amazon Prime or whatever. I was a little slow to the party on Transparent, but recently we just you know, had a long weekend and binged our way through that. Uh, I think I watched all of Jessica Jones within the first couple of days that it came out. I would say that's easily the best thing that Marvel has done on film or on TV in a long time. So I guess I'm drawn to um, uh, good writing where characters actually change, which by definition is not network television because uh, it's not, uh, uh, that's not the way the system works. They have to make shows that kind of continually start over and start over and start over so that you can join them at any time. So one of the things that I think is exciting about the streaming shows is that they assume that you're going to binge them or and they assume that you're going to consume them in a unit of a season. So there's a possibility for change over the course of that unit, which is not the case with most shows on network TV. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll say that I, I'm someone who, uh, before I started my, my job at Color Lines a couple, about nine months ago, I, and so I was someone who kind of struggled to be on top of TV trends. I kind of 
Um, I'm just the sort of type of person who I, I very much prefer things where it's like you can either jump in the middle because a show gives you some context before we can start following, or each episode is kind of like a standalone thing that doesn't necessarily have a continuity. Um, recently, I've gotten really into this call, uh, Comedy Central web series called White Flight. Um, I have a Q&A with uh, the two creators of the show that's coming out in Color Rides tomorrow. Look out for that. Um, Colorlines.com. <laughs> C-O-F-N. Um, but I, I've been really into that series. It's, it's uh, the premise of the series is in 2042, the person that run, when white people are the minority in America, the person who runs America at the time teleports all white people to Canada, except for a couple of emissaries for the U.S. government. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really funny, and um, they managed to do a lot in like episodes that are no longer than about seven or eight minutes. Um, my favorite show that's uh, coming back at some point is the Eric Andre show, and uh, I think that's like a brilliant comedy that's completely screwball and no one knows how smart it is. Thanks. Um, I actually want to slide in a book also because it's related to all this, but um, the past month or two, I've been really interested in stuff that is looking at modern communications technology, particularly social media, and how it affects our friendships and romantic relationships, which is something that um, Aziz Ansari is very interested in, right? Um, and so his book, Modern Love, if you haven't read it, it is not a comedy book. Uh, so if you're looking for a light comedic read, he actually teams up with a sociologist and does some pretty great research on what it's like to date in the era of online dating and insta messaging and text messaging. Um, and a lot of the things that he found through his research in that book actually shows up in the Master of None series, so it's interesting to see um, how that stuff is having different iterations in his life. Um, and then there's also a, a related to there's a podcast called Note to Self, which is also looking at um, the role of technology um, and how it affects our humanity. And they recently did an infomagical challenge, which I encourage people to look at, which is sort of how to deal with information overload. Um, and then, um, uh, for a documentary, I'm sort of just giving across different memes. Uh, now on Netflix streaming is Meet the Patels, which is, um, so I see plenty of people nodding, right? But um, Ravi Patel, who is in uh, this, uh, it's uh, something he did together with his sister, which is looking at the idea of like the paradox of choice, which is something that Aziz Ansari talks about a lot also, and, um, and the challenges of dating, particularly within the context of uh, coming from a family where your parents had an arranged marriage and had a long-term commitment. Um, yeah, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I've watched everything that you guys have watched, and, <laughs> yeah, and I, I love network TV too, fresh off the boat, um, blackish, all that stuff, I think it's really relevant, and I think we ought to be watching more of that stuff. Jane the Virgin? Jane the Virgin. Um, yeah, I, lo I love all that, but what I'm really interested in this moment is The People vs. O.J. Simpson. The first two episodes came out and I haven't seen episode three. And it's just so fun to watch John Travolta as Robert Shapiro. It's amazing, I love it. And I guess for me, I think possibly it's like I'm flipping from when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11 and watching it. And I remember watching the NBA Finals and not caring about O.J. Simpson even though I was in California, right? And now flipping and realizing, oh shit, that was like really important, and I should have cared about seeing the car chase and everything. So anyway, Cuba Gooding Jr., Robert, uh, John Travolta, amazing. So this next question, I thought um, since Peter is our um, resident academic that I could call upon him to just give us a little bit of context, to talk a little bit about the history of Asian Americans and East Asians versus South Americans in television or movies and media in general, if you would mind. I'm just thinking, you, she changed the question. Before. She told me she was going to ask me before. Uh, whatever um, version I had before, but since he said, well, I could have switched the two questions together. Well, I mean, I, I think everybody here knows that the, the history of uh, South Asian, uh, South, the history of South Asians in, in North America is different from the history of East Asians in North America. Obviously, the main difference is the legacy of British colonialism, uh, which means that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of South Asians in, in Canada uh, and, 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 uh, Anyway, and then so the, and the forces, the, the, the pattern, the period of, of, of great migration is different. So, I mean, uh, uh, whereas East Asian migration has been going on since, uh, since at least the late, late uh, 1800s, 
Uh, and of course, there were Sikhs and other migrants in, in the rural parts of the United, uh, the United States in, in the first early part of the 20th century. But more recently, it's been, you know, since uh, you know, there's there's since 1965 when uh, the federal government changed the immigration laws. That's when the big wave of migration have been, and that's when most of the uh, South Asians have migrated. So most of them have been a lot of them have been professionals, although obviously a lot of them are in more blue collar kind of kind of things. As far as television is concerned, television, of course, is a is a commercial medium. It's only been around since the 50s. Um, so uh, and 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 as we all know, it focused mostly on white people. Uh, occasionally on white ethnicity, but, but rarely. Um, during the 60s, when the civil rights movement was starting, there began to be more consciousness of these kinds of things. As far as Asian Americans are concerned, though, I think the main period in the 60s, the main thing that affected Asian Americans in television was uh, the expansion of the Vietnam War and the popularity of, of uh, spy, the spy genre, so I Spy and Men from Uncle and those kinds of things. So those guys would go would go to Asia all the time. So there'd be Asian crime and spies and villains and things like that. And then as I think you, as I think probably everybody here knows, Pat Morita had a shot at the first uh, sitcom starring an Asian American, Mr. T and Tina, very short lived. Margaret Cho was 1994, uh, 1994 for All American Girl and then nothing uh, until uh, fresh off the boat. <laughs> All right, terrific. Thank you. So, okay, so series co-creator Alan Yang thanked the critics and viewers during his portion of the acceptance speech, um, adding, um, thank you to all the straight white guys who dominated movies and TV so hard and for so long that stories about anyone else seemed kind of fresh and original now. So, how fresh is this? Anybody? Just, just to clarify, how fresh is what he said, or how fresh is <laughs> show. the show? Show. Show. Um, well, mean, actually, you can answer either one. He was being fresh. But, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think that it's exceptionally, uh, you know, novel for a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously, there's South Asians in television, and that, and that there's, there's more ubiquity of, of <clears throat> South Asians in TV now than the past, you know, five or so years than there have been. Uh, but this season, sorry, being like one of the most prominent ones. Um, but I think it's very rare that you've, I don't think it's act, there's actually a precedent where you've had a South Asian American lead co-creating a show, co-writing a show, starring in it as the lead, and able to explore as much as the show is able to explore in terms of show business racism. Um, you know, another episode dealt uh, with, with sexism and male privilege. Uh, you know, and then also to have a South Asian American man as a lead in, you know, romantic situations and kind of have and explore life and through kind of his eyes and experience all these things and cover all these different topics. Um, I mean, thematically, I think the only real predecessor that we have for a show like Master of None is uh, Louis, Louis C.K. show. And so this is big because it's not a white man who's helming this. It's a South Asian man uh, co-creating it with another Asian American, and that's rather significant. Yeah, ditto on what Samir said, and just to put some numbers behind it, um, I, in the sort of last report for the last TV season, so for the most recent TV season, they're not out yet, but um, less than 7% of the lead roles on broadcast television were people of color, and so I don't even know what the subdivision of that is for Southeast Asians and South Asians, but we can imagine that that's pretty small. Um, and then for creators of shows, that's less than 6% for broadcast television. Those numbers get a little bigger when you go to cable and then also digital streaming platforms like Hulu and Amazon and Netflix and we're definitely seeing that as a place of possibilities it's opening up those numbers are the way if you're interested in seeing more about um, the actual hard numbers of what's going on in the industry um, the Center for African American studies at um, UCLA issues a report every year and it's called the Hollywood diversity report but it's looking at both film and television and um, it's a great research uh, source for finding some quick facts like that um, and then the other thing I wanted to say also is that in addition to sort of the who and what they're talking about, I think the form of the show is really interesting to me too because each of the episodes has a really different structure to it and we're usually trained as media consumers like when we watch comedy that there's a certain progression of how things go when we're watching a drama on HBO there's a sort of narrative arc 
that happens in, in, in Master of None, like no two episodes really line up the same and you have things like this last episode um, where they're actually like traveling through time at a completely different pace than some of the episodes. Some people didn't like that um, about this series, but I think it's actually a very interesting way to challenge viewers to like experience these characters in different ways. Yeah, maybe picking it back off of that, the music is amazing. Every episode, I love the music. And I think there's definitely something for me emotionally about seeing a brown person on the screen that resonates, just resonates, you know, and especially seeing a, a Dumbo person on the screen uh, talking in Dumbo is, I think, powerful for me. Now, on the other hand, like when we're talking about how fresh this is, I think there's uh, another kind of dialogue, especially within, maybe within, you know, brown communities, Indian communities, about what's left out. And on the one hand, it's like the, the story of the parents. I think I was talking to one of my friends uh, about this, and she, she was telling me like, well, in Bollywood, this story of loving your parents is everywhere all the time. So like, how fresh is that is one thing. And then the second part is, what is he leaving out in terms of his identity, and how does that kind of keep us from really thinking about, you know, what it means to be Indian, Indian American? Uh, he's a Tamil Muslim. I'm not a Tamil Muslim. I would like to know more about that identity. Um, I think we'll talk about the questions of um, women of color in a couple minutes. Um, where is that? So I think if we're talking about freshness in terms of a complex story of being Indian American, there's a lot left to do. Uh, for an audience of maybe um, white folks and others who are just interested in brownness as a category, I think it's starting us somewhere, which is what makes it fresh. And actually, um, on that note, um, there's been some backlash about Ansari's choice of love interests in the show, um, that largely they've been white women. Do you feel the show should give more visibility to women of color? Do, would you like to comment on that? Well, yeah, obviously, I think that's, that's, that's like a no-brainer. But what I will kind of say, I was listening to um, Another Round, which is this Buzz, uh, BuzzFeed podcast, which is amazing. And one thing that uh, there was an episode recently about, uh, I forgot who was on it, a brown man was on the show. Anil Desh. Anil Desh, thank you. And he said, and... I thought it was interesting what he said, you know, about the aspiration of the brown man for white women, right? That is part of the post-colonial legacy and part of the American legacy, especially for a middle-class brown man to, like, aspire to date a white woman. And I, I just remember this because, and, I, and maybe it's not even just a white woman, it's anybody who's not Indian or brown is the aspiration. I, rem I remember that. Uh, and I was thinking about this just before uh, I got here. It suddenly came to me that I was, I was dating an a Asian woman in college, and I was walking down the street, and a, a couple brown people passed me this way. And I overheard them ask one another, how does somebody get a non-brown non -non woman? And I was like, whoa, that's something we think about. And so I, like, that resonated with this podcast and I think with the problems of the show, in terms of no woman of color, no brown woman. Yeah, I mean, obviously my own work is very much dedicated to creating a space for women of color on the screen, so it's something I um, care deeply about and, and thinking about all the time in my own work. That being said, the, the one, I agree, but the one caveat I will say that is one of the many challenging things about being marginalized by mainstream media and dominant culture is that when someone makes it, we all want so much from them. and. The goal for me is really to get to a place where people are co of color are afforded as wide of a spectrum as white people are in the media, right? And so the issue for me is less about is his love interest white or not. Right? <coughs> it is more about the fact that we have such a small sliver of representation. And I really, for me, the conversation is more like how do we get to a point where you can have people that are both pious and heretics, people who are, um, you know, nerds and who are outgoing, like that we have just a really wide spectrum of representation. And then part of that is also that you date and, you know, a variety of different people and there's different experiences, but within the context of what we've had so far on screen and within, like, you know, 
all the other power dynamics that exist, I totally understand why it's problematic and critique it as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll second everything that um, that they said, but um, I mean, I'll also add. I think uh, you know, well, first of all, I think that it would be really amazing to see him in like a relationship in the show with a woman of color because I think that's so much of the media that exists in film and television about South Asian American experience talks about this culture clash between South Asian culture and American culture that's defined by whiteness. And I think it would have been really nice to see a different narrative than that. Um, you know, I mean, you know, Master of None's culpable of that, The Namesake's culpable of that. Um, different country, but like a similar kind of concept of culture clash with the dominant culture being related to whiteness for a Bennett like Beckham, or a British Asian uh, you know, family. But, um, uh, oh, and the, and the Mindy Project, too. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I almost forgot about that show, because <laughs> uh, it's, it's on Hulu. Um, no. Um, but, uh, no, but, um, but I, also, I also think, you know, when he was doing the press tour and stuff for this show, he was talking very frankly about uh, how Hollywood's race stats kind of uh, conspire, or any you know, the forces of racism in Hollywood kind of conspire to keep, like, uh, you know, people of color marginalized along certain sort of number lines. They addressed it in the Indians and TV episode a little bit. But um, I can't help but think that that was at play in greenlighting the series too. Like just because he's going out on the press tour doing it, just because the show is picked up by Netflix, which is more progressive, I just, I don't think that they like are, you know, so progressive. I don't think that they're so like, have the high mind ideals. I think they still have like, you know, they might be a bit stuck in the past. You might have this idea of what markets or what plays that's still kind of antiquated. Um, and increasingly not supported by evidence that you brought up. So, so I think, like, um, you know, if if that was the show where he was dating a woman of color, I don't think we'd be sitting here because I don't think that show would have gotten a Netflix order. So we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. I also just want to put out there, though, and if for folks who don't know, like Aziz Ansari's girlfriend <laughs> in real life is a blonde white woman, right? Like you should look her up. She's like, you know, I don't, she's not much, she's a chef, but she's like a tall Amazon <laughs> And so, um, she, that is also his lived experience. And I also just think that there's that question that is always the difficult thing when you're, like, when you're the first or one of the sort of, um, I don't want to say pioneers, because that's not the right word to use, but, um, but, you know, like, one of the first people to break through is, like, do you tell your lived experience, or do you uh, use that moment to address all the larger issues at hand? Well, I mean, obviously, I agree with you, and, and especially about that. Uh, uh, I th we've we've all experienced this kind of that. Uh, there's, you know, Margaret Cho is coming, and everybody wants it to do everything all at once, and it gets more criticism than, than anything else because people are watching it. So obviously, that that's that's a problem. Um, at the same time, so so I, I um, so we. But but I but I know you're not saying so. Let's just give it a pass on everything because obviously you're not saying that. Um, and we expect these shows to have a certain kind of um, uh, something about them has to feel real and and authentic, even though whatever that means, right? Um, and uh, which which doesn't mean that we have to be the authenticity police about things and say like oh that's not the right uh, you know that's that's. They're, they're, they're not eating basmati rice, why are they eating this other kind of rice? That's not accurate, right? It, it doesn't mean, but on the other hand, if you remember back from, uh, if you remember All-American Girl um, way back when, uh, there's, a, there's a scene early on where the mother goes to a rice cooker and she scoops in the rice and kind of pours it out, and it's, it's loose rice, it kind of rained down, it wasn't a clump of rice, it was just kind of like, what? Asian people, rice don't, that doesn't do that. Rice pilaf does that, but you know, Asian people, rice sticks together, so that's, you know, and it's like a small thing, but as soon as that happened, you could sense just people just emotionally turning off, just like, I don't care that they look like me, that's not actually like my family at all, right? So, I mean, it's, it's these weird, we, I mean, this show, Master of None, feels real, and, and one of the things that feels real about it is that he clearly knows Indian culture, knows Indian food, but he's like, what's he excited about? He's excited about making spaghetti carbonara. You know, it's, that's, that's, actually, I don't know if, they, if you're following him on Instagram right now, he's in Italy right now, yeah. and he's putting up pictures of food that he's eating in Italy, so, you know, that, that's who he is.
I'm jumping off of that for the next controversy. Um, this is coming from <laughs> episode that we actually watched Indians on TV. So there's been a lot of controversy revolving around that episode um, because Aziz's character Dev says, people don't get fired up about racist Asian or Indian stuff. I feel like you only risk starting a brouhaha if you say something bad about black people or gay people. Um, thoughts? I agree. <laughs> um, I, I, can, I can give an anecdote. Uh, a couple of years, oh God, how long ago was it? This was sort of been, this would have been about 20 years ago too. Um, Fox Movie Channel um, had the rights to the Charlie Chan series of films. And um, the, the rights were expiring, so you know, they, they, they had them for a while. So they, wanted, they were gonna run all of them on the Fox Movie Channel and make money off of it. Um, and, uh, which, you know, is fine. And, but then, but then uh, some Asian American community watch dog organizations and stuff kind of were like, this is a little screwed up, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And we kind of went back and forth and the compromise was, because nobody was saying don't air these things, nobody was saying censor these things, the compromise was they aired four of the movies in the air and they, and they included a panel. Uh, I was on that panel, but there were like uh, eight people talking about putting these, putting these, putting these movies into context. Um, because we don't, it's part of film history, it's not like we can just say, don't show it because it's, no, show it, but put it into context. But the point of the actor that I'm making is, when, so we had to now decide, we're not going to show 50-some films, we're going to show four films. And we're trying to decide which ones to show. Um, and we were debating, oh, let's show this one, this one's interesting, blah, 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 blah. And the one show that was not on the table, Fox Movie Channel, would not show Charlie Chan in Egypt. And the reason they wouldn't show Charlie Chan in Egypt was because Step and Fetch It was in it. In other words, even in this context, where they knew they were going to show movies that were racially problem, they knew enough to be like, well, we can't mess with the black people, even though he's a minor character actor in the context of a Charlie Chan film. They were willing to run the entire series of Charlie Chan films. They didn't care what the Asian American community would think, but they didn't want to run one film with an African American uh, character from a particular period. So, yes, uh, people, yes, completely, people are uh, give a People get more mad about representation of, of African Americans and, and certain other groups. Um, I, I mean, I think that's at least partially true, but I think, that, as you said, I mean, there's, there's some context behind it. And, and so I think that one of the big things the context to understand is like, um, you know, there are bigger and more kind of prominent advocacy wings in, in show business for LGBT, for at least for, you know, like gay men in the form of GLAD and then like uh, black performers in the form of, I think, the NAACP, maybe other organizations. Mm -hmm. So there's more of a history, more of a concerted effort of activism in show business to kind of raise awareness to these things in show business. Um, I think that that's like, you know, there's, there's just some of that lacking, I think, in, uh, in, with regards to Asian Americans and, and to a lesser extent uh, with Latinos. But um, I, I mean, it, there, I saw that line, I was like, oh God. Like, because I get why he could, he, a person in his position would think that, but I also, in Deb's position, but I also I worry that people might see that line and be like, oh yeah, man, it's like, why don't we talk about this? Like, you know, like, and, and there's just a context behind it. And it's like his friend said in the thing, like, first of all, nothing really happens when people say the N word or say homophobic things, right? Like, like Michael Richard, you know, uh, Richard's a, you know, Kramer on Seinfeld, like in 2008, like, I think screamed the N word at like a stand up show. And he wasn't like quoting a rap song, he like screamed the N-word at a table of black people. And like, multiple times. And I, you know, his, did his career recover from that? Probably not. But he was able to go on to curb your enthusiasm a few years later and parody the whole incident. Like, he's able to do that and then there aren't like, people of color in like, leading roles or like commanding shows. So, I mean, if it's a brouhaha, it doesn't really actually lead to a ton of system, like, real systemic change. I think that we are possibly experiencing something new with that in Hollywood now with Oscars so white that I don't, I mean, I, I wouldn't, people get away with anti-blackness and homophobia in Hollywood all the time. People make a stink about it, but nothing really happens. So, I mean, I just, if there's people not making a quote-unquote brouhaha about anti-South Asian things or like uh, anti-Asian things, it's, um, there's a context in which there's still a bigger erasure happening to other populations, I would argue. Yeah, I'll just jump off where you talked about context, and um, for me, this joke it, it makes me think about allyship and why allyship between Indian Americans and 
other communities of color in the United States doesn't happen all the time. And that has everything to do with privilege. It has everything to do with the fact that the Indian Americans who came over, including Aziz's family in the 1970s and 80s, came over at a time when they came over because of their education. And so they naturally ally with white folks in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the context for this. And the second context is that in the last 20 years, India is like the biggest democracy and capitalist democracy in the world. And so, of course, you've got the CEO of Google, who is an Indian, right, from India. All of this stuff, which gives Indian Americans an immense privilege, right? And that's why there's a lack of kind of allyship that there ought to be, right, up in situations like this. So I get a little more uncomfortable with the joke because, you know, the far end of that is Mindy Kaling's brother. Which, um, yeah, which is just, you know, you want to be, you want to laugh, but you laugh really uncomfortably because it's really hor horrible, right? Like, we know what, we know what he's about, right? His anti-affirmative action stuff where he, like, dressed up as a black man and put in an application as a black man to prove that it was easier if you're black to get into medical school, you know? And so, like... The entertainment industry is part of a much broader history and a much broader history of violence and oppression in this country, and so we don't want to just. I'd be hesitant to go anywhere close to where um, Aziz is going here. Uh, let's, let's put it that way. It's just been greenlit for season two. What would you like to see this show take on? Um, well, just kind of for some of the things that. Um, that we were just talking about. I would like to see him investigate his privilege a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, see, you know, we had one episode that was sort of him investigating his relational privilege, being a man, to you know, women that he was friends with, the woman he was dating. Um, and I would like to see him maybe investigate that more as someone with an education, someone who um, is not black, um, as someone who uh, you know is part of a group that has benefited from. Uh, you know, as you said, kind of like divisions created and aspirations towards whiteness for, you know, quote unquote model minority kinds of things, which are also agency limiting, but they are privileging in a sense. Um, so I would love to see that relationship explored. And also in the last, I mean, are there people that haven't seen the last episode here? Yes. Yeah. I will not say the other thing. <laughs> Spoiler alert. All right. So we're safe from that. I just want to know more about his parents, you know, his parents and his friends' parents and where they come from, you know, like, there's so much there about that history, you know, he's, he puts up Dernal, Dernal Valley, Tamil Nadu, and I want to know about that, you know, I want to know the depth of that experience, and that has everything to do, of course, with his religion, and he hides that, and I think that needs to come out if he wants this show to do what it could do. There's just so much potential here. I'm, I'm saying all this only because I think it goes back to what you said earlier. It's the, it's the first, and it's the danger of the single story. I always come back to that with uh, Chimamanda and Ngozi Adichie's work, where she talks about, you know, as a Nigerian author, a Nigerian woman author, how she gets read and how that one book of hers, Mary Connick, gets read. And in the same way, like, the danger is there because of how we're getting read, so that adds to our responsibilities. So you just got to do that work, I feel like and especially with his parents, because they're awesome. Yeah. I would say ditto on what uh, was just said, and then what I would add to that also is I'm, I'm interested also in just a little bit more exploration of masculinity um, and how that intersects with the other aspects of his identity. I, I think it's an interesting choice. So the, the only episode that's not written by Alan Yang and Aziz Ansari is the one that's looking at um, sexism or like experience of, of women, of some particular woman, I would say. But they're, they, that episode to me is actually the weakest one in the series. And so I would actually like to see him and Alan Yang address it as men. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I mean, <laughs> the reality is I, I trust they're, they're both very intelligent. And, and, and sensitive guys, and, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to that second season. Uh, I, you know, whatever, they, whatever they're into. Um, I, th I think it's really, uh, I'm really impressed with, with with what you said about you know, listening to take on their own privilege. I think that that's a, um, 
and you know, masculinity and all that. That's basically the same, the same way. That's a really um, that's a difficult thing for anybody to do to take on their own their own privilege, and, and that would be amazing. Mm -hmm.